The early American leaders who settled on E Pluribus Unum for the motto of the United States probably had no idea just how many different kinds of people would become a part of this nation. But right now, the concept of out of many, one in our modern society can feel a little antiquated. As we honor the work and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we take a closer look at our increasingly divided politics from the perspective of race. Joining us this morning are Dr. Dottie Morris, the Associate Vice President for Institutional Equity and Diversity at Keene State. Dr. Morris, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And Rogers Johnson, who is uh, the President of Seacoast NAACP and also the head of the Governor's new Advisory Council on Diversity in the state of New York. Andrew, thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure, Ed. So uh, the news towards the end of the week here uh, is that uh, the president has made some comments, uh, and he's disputing them now, essentially, that um, referring, using a, a vulgarity to refer to uh, countries from which we are receiving immigrants of late, and also wondering why can't we have more people coming from a country like Norway? Um, we talk about dog whistles sometimes. This one is right out there. Dr. Morris, first, first out, what's your reaction to those statements, alleged statements? Uh, on my first reaction to those statements, um, uh, I, I was surprised, uh, one, um, but not shocked. Um, I think that that has been pretty clear, the, the mentality that we've had in the United States for quite a while, that, that certain groups of people were more acceptable because they fit within what we thought the America should be, that, uh, that, was the, that was based on what they thought the Founding Fathers wanted. So I wasn't shocked, I was surprised. Uh, second, the second reaction I had is the, the lack of understanding or the lack of depth of the, the history and the heritage uh, that in individuals from the countries he was referring to um, that they could bring um, the multiple things that they've already contributed uh, to not only the United States but the world at large. So uh, the first thing I thought as an educator is while wow, we have to get out there and teach way more than we are. And, and Mr. Johnson, uh, again, this is an alleged statement um, and it's in dispute, but the consequences of people thinking that these are the president's words. Well, Adam, you may be surprised with what I'm about to say. I really don't have that much concern about what's going on in Washington for one main reason. It's out of my sphere of influence. I'm more concerned about what goes on here in New Hampshire. Um, outside of voting and probably giving money to a candidate or not, or not um, my real concern is what things can I control within my sphere? And my sphere is right here in New Hampshire. I can't really have an impact on the people in Washington, D.C. Let them do what they're going to do, and we'll be concerned about what happens to the people of this state. Yeah, and I think when you were introduced uh, as the new head of the Governor's Council on Diversity and Inclusion, people, you were asked essentially about these, these statements by President Trump that pop up every so often, and you said, I'm going to work around those things. Uh, can you discuss that a little more, the idea of when it's time to confront something like that and when it's time to continue the dialogue, essentially? Well, essentially, what we're really concerned about is how do we get along here? How do we make this state better? How do we... Uh, address those issues amongst the population here because if we do those things here we make the state more accessible inclusive better from an economic standpoint better from an education standpoint we make it more appealing to those individuals outside of the state to want to relocate here to bring their businesses here um, that's my, my, my main goal I can't control what goes on in Washington DC let other people worry about that I'm worried about us. Dr. Morris, what do you think about that? This, uh, the idea that um, you know, the president's words, for some people, it can get in there and it can cause a lot of consternation. Um, but, but the need to confront versus the need to continue a dialogue or work around it, right. as Mr. Johnson's saying. What do you right. think Right. And, and part of, again, I go back to my role as an educator provide as many opportunities for us to have these conversations, to talk about the implications of having that type of mentality out there. Uh, because a lot of the young people that I work with will be future leaders and will be making some decisions that could roll back some of the decisions that we currently have. So uh, I, I totally agree this whole idea about how do uh, I have an impact on my sphere of influence. And, and I think that through the work that we do with young people in this state, um, and because it is a small state, and we can have an impact, yeah. and I think that uh, we will have an impact uh, as a result of some of the work that we're planning to do. And, and speaking of impact, Mr. Johnson, what are your goals uh, for this new Governor's Council? Oh boy, they're ambitious. Um, 
And more importantly, a, a little bit daunting if you think about it, because uh, what, we're, what we're talking about is nothing less than historic mm -hmm. for what's actually happening. Um, in many ways, what we're hoping to do is start the process of um, doing a diversity um, involvement for people so that they understand how they are going to impact the changing demographics of the state, not just you know with police or elected officials or even our educators, but for everyone who really touches the public. And I want you to think about that first for a, a brief moment. How many people are we really talking about throughout the entire state to do this in a fashion where we can be, with a metric, we can see the things that we're doing have an impact on how they then interact, uh, mainly because in this state we're beginning to see something that's never happened before. Individuals who are living in the North Country who are all of a sudden finding that their next door neighbor doesn't look like them. Um, to that degree that we begin to prepare the state for that change is the degree that we're going to be um, more diverse, more inclusive, and uh, advance economically, educationally. And Dr. Moore, as you mentioned the education aspect of this, right. with New Hampshire so lacking in diversity, mm -hmm. is that one of those for, first and foremost goals, at least I'm sure work that you've been doing here, is really right. just breaking down a barrier for people of just not knowing uh, someone, a person of color, essentially? Right. And, and, you know, for me, it goes beyond just knowing, but really understanding yeah. how we're all interrelated and interconnected. And also this, this great thing about uh, how diversity is kind of, for me, the mother of intervention. Mm -hmm. Because if you continue to do things the same way, with people thinking in the exact same way, you, you'll have the same results. But just when you think about multiple people coming with multiple perspectives, ways of seeing the world, ways of doing things, I think that that's the part that's so powerful. And so even if we, quote, lack diversity uh, in the state, I think that there are ways that we can definitely infuse it in everything we do, including uh, some of the decisions that we make about who uh, we need in the state, who could come into the state, how we employ people. I, I think it's I'm excited about the opportunity to do more. Mm -hmm. Is racism a problem here in New Hampshire? Well, you know, that's a hard answer because it, it depends on uh, so many things because um, when people think about racism, they think about the overt types of actions that people engage in, cross burnings or, um, you know, screaming racial slurs. Um, when I think about it, I think about it that way. But I also think about some of the institutional barriers that are put in, in front of people where they're not allowed to really full, reach their full potential is as it relates to their race. Um, and so we have some situations and structures in place. Uh, again, I'm not saying it's intentional, uh, there's that whole idea of implicit bias, um, but those, uh, it doesn't matter if it's intentional or not, it is interrupting the process for a lot of people uh, of different racial backgrounds. And Mr. Johnson, what, what is your perspective on racism here in New Hampshire? Well, what Dr. Morris has just said is essentially uh, the reality of, of New Hampshire. The vast majority of them, of the people of the state, don't realize mm -hmm. that they're racist. And so what we're now attempting to do is to bring that awareness, but also to do something else, which is very important. Not to promote the concept of tolerance, okay. because I can tolerate you and still hate you. Mm -hmm. right. But I want to bring the concept of acceptance. I need to have people accept the other individual who may be different than them, and by accepting, that means walk around in their shoes a little bit, understanding who they are, how, what their perspective may be. To that degree, when you have a, a level of acceptance, it becomes very difficult to become racist because you see what that person is saying and you understand why they would react to something differently than you. When we dr uh, bring that level of education throughout the state, we're going to be much better off in the future. The, the concept of implicit bias is a hard one to confront, too, especially yes. uh, a, a term like white privilege, uh, right. something that's real, uh, but you take that to someone who is disadvantaged or, or impoverished, and they're going to react differently, probably, in saying, oh, I'm privileged, and they don't even see that. So right. 
This is difficult. It's a t difficult subject to broach, I think. Right. It is, it's very complex. And I think that that's why we have to find multiple ways to approach the same, um, to, to have the same end. So we can't just say we'll do it through dialogue, but we have to do it a variety of, of modalities. And I think that uh, you're right. It's uh, kind of like carbon monoxide. Hmm. Um, you know, it's there, it's having an impact, but you're not aware of it. And so part of what we have to do is make the unconscious conscious. And by doing that, it's not about beating people up or uh, inflicting any type of wounds on other people. It's about having people understand the impact that their behavior that's motivated by something that's unconscious is still having an impact on other people. And therefore, because we're interrelated, it's having an impact on them. And Adam, this really isn't a zero sum game, meaning because we do something means that we're taking something right. away from someone that's else. Right. This is a process by which everybody benefits by what we're trying to do. Right. So we don't want anyone to think that when we go through these steps, individuals gain, individuals lose. And this issue, everybody gains and that must be the most important thing that we get across because the pushback that we're going to get is from that fear that because we do this someone is going to lose that's not going to be the case here mm -hmm. you look back at last year uh, what happened in charlottesville and certainly a lot of these conversations were um maybe this has been here all along and we're just seeing it uh, mm -hmm. more as a community and, and a culture for the first time but are you optimistic right now about the future and we'll start with you mr johnson this current generation of young people more so than any other generation that has existed in this country. Um, I'm so very optimistic, mainly because they don't have the same fears, biases that we had growing up. They're much more inclusive. They're much more understanding. Their level of acceptance of other individuals, whether by race, gender, sexual orientation, is so much more developed at this early age than anyone. I am optimistic because this generation who will, at some point, and I hope they hurry up, um, become the future leaders of this country. Because of that, my optimism is, is beyond the roof. It's just tremendous. I just hope that in the interim that we have an opportunity to have this discussion with the broad panoply of people in the state to bring them to that level. Now that is the challenge. Right. And Dr. Morris, optimistic about the future? Very optimistic. I get to see it every day. I, I feel so blessed and gift and, 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 and feel like such a gift every day to see uh, the way that young people are uh, willing to engage in some very difficult conversations uh, about uh, because they see it as their future. Mm -hmm. And I think that they really understand the, the that we're inter the part that I keep talking about, how we're so interrelated, and they understand that they can't be who they need to be unless everyone else is who they need to be. That's a kind of a paraphrase of something that Dr. King said. And so I think that it's very important that we keep impressing that on each other, uh, that we see each other's humanity when we look into each other's eyes and into each other's hearts. And I think that um, we're on a good roll here. And, 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 and the other thing is uh, failure is not an option in my mind. Mm. All right. Well, Dr. Morris and Mr. Johnson, we thank you so much for your perspectives this morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Adam. it.